Our next speaker is very hard to introduce someone who is a bit of a legend in the Philippine uh, political arena. Um, she has an unparalleled track record and her stewardship for the environment is incomparable. Um, so it is very hard for me to introduce someone who I had the privilege of meeting, but I will try. Um, our next speaker uh, is chiefly responsible for the passage of landmark legislation, namely the Environmental Awareness Act, Education Act, the Renewable Energy Act, Ecological Solid Waste Management Act, Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Act, the Climate Change Act, and its amendatory laws. Um, now on her first, third, third term as senator, she chairs the Com Senate Committee on Climate Change, which is a very important committee. Uh, Senate Committee on Finance and Cultural uh, Communities. She's a cum laude graduate of the University of Philippines for, with a degree of broadcasting communications. And was she was first elected in, uh, I think, 1998 and continues to serve as senator up to this day. Her inspiring advocacy on environmental protection has earned her global recognition. She is named as one of the global leaders for tomorrow by the World Economic Forum a laureate, and in the Global uh, 500 Roll of Honor in the U UN Environmental Program. In recognizing her commitment to the fight against climate change and to the promotion of culture and heritage, the French government bestowed upon Senator Lauren Legarda the title of Knight in the French National Order of the Legion of Honor. So ladies and gentlemen, I'm pleased to welcome Senator Lauren Legarda. Thank you very much and good morning to all of you. Attorney Wolf, uh, thank you for that kind introduction and I'm glad that we have organizations sponsoring this event and summits such as this. And I thank uh, my colleague in the lower house, Congressman Ray Umali, the real expert on energy. And I'm glad that we have allies in the RE sector and showing and bravely, courageously speaking on the true cost and externalities of coal. So Kong Ray, we're glad that you were re-elected. So I will have a colleague in the house who can courageously push for a stronger RE sector, not to be bullied by the big coal developers. And um, we're glad that the ERC chair is present here. As I see him more often, he gets more boyish and younger than he looks because I used to work with him in the DOJ when he was uh, the implementer of a law that I did in my first term, the anti-trafficking in persons. Uh, I don't know which is a more um, uh, stressful job for him, the DOJ or this, but looks like the ERC is less stressful because he looks younger today. Uh, Chair Jovi, yes, uh, I hope with the speech of um, our good re-elected congressman and this brief message I will say today, the ERC, we can have an ally in the ERC, which I know, to push more indigenous resources for the Philippines. And of course, the organizers. What kind of future are we leaving behind for our children? Our extractive and consumptive lifestyle and misplaced notion of development have brought our world to a state of utter disrepair. We have been so focused on development without realizing that development without conscience destroys the world. It is reported that 215 or 2015, the year, registered the hottest summers in the Northern Hemisphere ever since or since recording began in 1880. The highest temperature for Metro Manila last year was 39.4 degrees Celsius. And in April this year, Manila's hottest temperature peaked at 37.7 degrees Celsius. The global temperature is getting hotter every year. 2015, the hottest year ever recorded. And before that, 2014 was the hottest year on record. Pagasa made a bold prediction that this year can be a candidate for the warmest or one of the warmest years with daily maximum temperature of 40 degrees Celsius in Tugigarao in Cagayan. 
El Niño is said to be weakening now. However, La Niña is believed to be not too far behind. Scientists have blamed human activity, particularly increased carbon dioxide emissions as a major cause of anomalies in our weather system. And according to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, human activity released 545 gigatons of carbon dioxide from 1750 to 2011. And it is projected that if 1,000 gigatons of carbon dioxide is emitted, which at current rates will likely occur between 2040 and 2050, there is a one in three possibility that a two degrees Celsius limit above pre-industrial levels will be exceeded. And in the last decade, 90% of the rise in carbon dioxide levels was due to the burning of fossil fuels. As one of the countries most vulnerable to climate change, the Philippines needs to lead in a global advocacy efforts for the massive reduction of GHGs or greenhouse gas emissions. By leading, we cannot demand action from others while we continue to aimlessly approve the construction of coal-fired power plants. Nothing builds and sustains credibility like an advocate who leads by practice. In fact, I'm sure Kong Ray and ERC chair know it. As early as December, I'm digressing from my speech, uh, of 2013, Secretary Pahe wrote President Aquino, give a copy of that letter, that warned him to please stop the issuance of permits or allocations for coal-fired plants. 2014 happened, 2015 happened, then 2016. And in the Senate hearings, no less than my good friend Bon Pahe and the EMB and the USEX of DNR assured me that they would no longer approve ECCs for coal. While we are discussing COP agreements before COP21 in Paris last December, what do I find out? Behind our back, Ray, the DNR approved additional coal plants in September, October, and November of last year. Well, the team was already in Paris committing to 75% reduction of greenhouse gas emissions, of course conditional. Well, here was a government department approving, and I can give you the list, like a midnight overnight deal, approving hundreds and hundreds of additional ECCs for coal-fired plants. Did you know that? I'm glad we have another ally present here of um, the pioneer in solar um, in Negros of the Zapaleta group, yes. So I've been passionate about the environment and renewable before my young son has ventured into this. And it's not a matter of economics or business. It is a matter of what is right for our country and humanity. And it is just so disconcerting that while we are assured that there will be a moratorium on the issuance of ECCs for coal plants, and while there had been an urging by our executive to the president, there were hundreds, and I can give you the list, hundreds of megawatts approved late last year, like a midnight approval. It has been said many times that as a developing nation, we need energy to build the foundations of our growth. I subscribe to a healthy energy mix, but not on the misguided action that our country should develop and acquire the energy and power it needs at all costs, regardless of whether it sustains or kills life. Today's issue is not just about security of energy supply. It is not just about the reliability or even the affordability. It is about increasing clean energy supply, using it wisely and efficiently and efficiently and effectively. Energy security that assails the safety of our people and the environment and biodiversity and the source of food can never guarantee inclusive development. Let us just take a look at how other countries are doing. The US, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, Chair Jovi, has already canceled all coal operating contracts at as it has been developing renewables like solar, wind, 
as its main energy sources. And last three years, renewables accounted for almost two-thirds, or 63.85% of their new electric generation. China, again, please correct me if I'm wrong, is halting the approval of new coal mines for at least three years as of January 2016. And it is a country which is vulnerable in the world that is approving new coal-fired power plants. And I hope the ERC does something about this. In Europe, they are scaling down on coal. And they say that because the US and Europe are scaling down on coal, all of these suppliers, developers are coming to Asia and the Philippines with huge coal lobby so that we say that there's such a thing as clean coal, etc., and we increase the energy mix to coal because they always say it's cheaper, etc. Clean coal. Who said that there's such a thing as clean coal? Who said that there's such a thing as healthy cigarettes? Is it not synonymous? Clean coal is like saying they're healthy cigarettes. Germany is a solar superpower, but only receives half the intensity of the sunlight we enjoy in the Philippines. There are countries that have the capacity to source 100% of their power requirements from RE. On windy days, Denmark can produce as much as 140%, amazing, of its requirements. Iceland, through its geothermal energy, can source up to 100% of its power requirements from RE. Other countries have also invested in renewables on business and residential premises. More than a million residential properties in Australia now have solar systems installed. Pay-as-you-go schemes are used to provide solar power to off-grid communities in developing countries like Bangladesh and Tanzania. And I hope that we could do something about, the, about Meralco so that solar rooftops are not discouraged. Because from what I hear, uh, while there are many residentials and SMEs that want to have solar rooftops, the process takes long and could be expensive and does not encourage this system. Grameen Shakti, founded by Dr. Muhammad Yunus, a Nobel Peace Laureate, installed solar home systems in a million homes in 2012 in Bangladesh. I wish we could have that in the Philippines. This proves that renewable energy technologies can be promoted in rural areas in developing nations. If global projections point to a decline in the share of coal in power generation, and countries are shifting to 100% renewables, why then is the Philippines taking the opposite track. The explanation given by most is anchored on very simplistic assumptions. They say that coal-fired power plants are the country's dominant power technology because economically there are, they are widely available and easy to build. People say RE is expensive and coal is cheap. First, this does not, as Kong Ray O'Malley says, take into account the true cost of coal. We need to factor in the externalities of coal-generated power. Coal affects our health. It kills biodiversity and the environment. It affects our water systems. It pollutes the air that we breathe. It increases the risk of climate change. Second, RE is cheaper than some conventional fuels. In rural off-grid areas, electricity must be sourced from expensive diesel fuel. Instead of subsidizing diesel for gensets in remote islands, we should instead turn to solar, hydro, biomass, geothermal, or wind power. Third, the cost of renewable energy is inflated by the cost of doing business in our country. Project developers are faced with a long list of bureaucratic requirements. While some may be necessary because of the law that we authored in 2008, but many are products of subjective whims of public officials. And I think this has to change. 800 signatures for a permit, that's too much, right? So not all is lost. I actually applaud the streamlining of the RE service contract application process by the DOE, previously from two years to 45 days, I believe. I acknowledge the fact, and I'm pragmatic and realistic, that we cannot totally get rid of coal today since we have not yet developed enough base load renewable energy, unless I'm mistaken, we need to see coal as a transi transition energy source, but scale up fast on RE. We seek the development of more 
renewable energy capacity so that in time, we can achieve greater self-sufficiency, sustainability, and security in the energy sector. Our country is rich in renewable energy, you know that. Estimates from past studies of the U.S. National Renewable Energy Laboratory indicate that the Philippines has 246,000 megawatts of untapped RE capacity. This is actually 13 times more than our current installed capacity. And I can say we have reached considerable progress, but we can't stop just yet. We should have a good energy mix where there is a bias for renewables. And with the new coal plants given ECCs, we see them constructing from 2018 and beyond. And Kong Ray is correct in saying that by 2030, is it? Or 2035, if it's a business as usual scenario, the 30-30-30 mix will become 70% in favor of coal. And this means that even if we produce RE, whether wind, biomass, even geo, and solar, because the coal contracts will be, what, 20 to 25 years from 2018, 2020, to 2040 or 2045, and even if the cost of renewables will decline as it has declined, and the availability of battery storage will be available soon, which will make the problems of renewables, the intermittency and all of that, will which solve the problem. But still, because the government has granted the ECCs and they will continue to build unless opposed by the ERC and by Congress, we will lock in the next generation, the next five administrations to expensive imported fuel that is dirty. Do we leaders of today have a right to lock in the next generation to dirty fuel, which could be expensive. We have an RE law, ably authored by many of our colleagues, that provides for the full development and the use of RE in our country. It is said that, yes, we have one of the best RE laws in the world. We have adopted it long before other countries have implemented it. The feed-in tariff, net metering, the RPS, is it already being implemented? Renewable portfolio standards, maybe not yet, is it? The green energy option, the renewable energy market, other fiscal incentives such as income tax holidays, etc. I'm not sure if the whole RE law is actually being implemented to encourage more RE in our country. The National Renewable Energy Program has set out aggressive targets on renewable energy development from 2011 to 2030, aiming to increase RE capacity to 15,304 megawatts by 2030. I, I think this, should be, this could be much, much more. There have been challenges in our efforts to fast track the development of our renewable energy resources more aggressively. Impacts on electricity pricing have been a major consideration among our regulators, particularly as we already have one of the highest electric rates in the world. We import much of the oil and the coal we use, thus making us vulnerable to price fluctuations. Renewables are an indigenous resource, and we are responsible for setting its price. In essence, we have greater control over the pricing of RE, thereby mitigating the pricing risks. The development of the country's RE resources is supposed to be our long-term response to our huge oil import bill. Prices of RE technologies, as you very well know, have significantly gone down since 2008. The price of solar panels, for example, has gone down by at least 80% since 2008. What we need now to address intermittency is to have cheaper energy storage, and there are companies that are already rapidly decreasing the cost of batteries. There are two compelling reasons for accelerating the development and utilization of renewable energy in the country, energy self-sufficiency and environmental sustainability. Growth is difficult to imagine without energy. Energy that does not take into consideration the needs of the future generations can only destroy and not build sustainably. Development, progress, quality of life cannot be the exclusive domain of a few. Quality of life comes with a price tag, not necessarily beyond our reach. 
Building livable cities and communities requires good, wise planning. More importantly, it requires a genuine commitment to the ultimate goal of putting the Earth's and our people's survival foremost over all other concerns. Last April 22, and I was there in the UN in New York, where the Philippines and 174 other nations signed the Paris Agreement on Climate Change, which aims to limit global temperature rise within the century well below two degrees Celsius and to drive efforts to limit the temperature's increase even further to 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. And the Philippines has committed to reduce GHG emissions by 70% by 2030 from the business as usual scenario from energy, transport, waste, industry, and forestry. We may not be a major emitter in the world, 0.3%. But that does not mean that we have no obligation to promote environmental sustainability. In fact, those who may not agree with us here, I call them the dinosaurs, who may not understand the need completely, would say, why should we mitigate? Why should we reduce greenhouse gas emissions when we're less than 1%? But remember, developing nations of the world, if they think this way, that we can use coal as much as we want because the others have gone and used coal decades ago and have industrialized and developed, and we can do it now. If all developing nations think this way, what kind of a world will we have? So while we committed to do this, we need to deliver on our commitment. We can only meet this if there is a radical shift in the way our country develops our indigenous clean energy resources readily available. The Philippines likewise committed to achieve the objectives last year in Sendai, Japan, on the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction and the Sustainable Development Goals last September in 2015 in New York. The energy sector has a crucial role to play in achieving these goals. But whatever sector or industry we belong to, we are all obliged to be stewards of the earth and its resources. The world is not just about us. The future is not 20 years from now. It begins today, dedicated to those who will be born beyond our time. It is clear injustice to let future generations suffer the irreversible consequences of our irresponsible actions. The climate crisis presents the opportunity to promote green, sustainable, socially inclusive growth for the sake of humanity and the only planet we call home. We should act to protect the earth, not just with a sense of urgency, but rather with a sense of great emergency. So I would just like to end with just one statement to summarize what I thought would be a brief speech, but actually ended up long. Why should we, leaders of today, lock in the next generation to dirty, expensive fuel when we have indigenous energy resources readily available in our country today? With that thought, I will leave it to the leader of the ERC and my colleague, in the House, a chair of the Energy Committee, and all of you big players in the energy sector to rethink what is the right thing to do. Thank you very much.